a couple of things we want to do tonight. We're going to spend just a few minutes at the beginning to talk to you about a wellness program that we want to launch for all of you. There have been a lot of people involved in trying to put some things together here. Um, a couple of the people I'm going to introduce, many of you know. Uh, Chris Castillo and the Health Staff Council has been involved. Sharon Media has been involved. So we'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and then secondly, is obviously our featured speaker, Dr. Mazzarella. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about business and medicine. Um, again, with these four lectures, I keep telling you, there's so many things other than what your specialty is that to be a doctor in 2015, 2020, whenever you enter the workforce, that you really need to know. And we realize that we haven't provided you with that information very well. So we're doing our best to try to figure out some of those topics, present them to you, and we appreciate the fact that you're taking your time and you're coming here. Um, I'm very open to different topics. We have a, a four lecture series group, but if you want to email me the topics that you really want to hear about, um, this is really your curriculum. So I'm more than willing to add things, change things up. I want to make it something that you say, not, oh my gosh, I have to do another one of those things tonight, versus, wow, I'm going to learn about something tonight that's going to help me as I go forward in my career. So that's why I feel about that. Um, so wellness. The, um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story. The, the, you know, I, I really always thought that this whole wellness thing was a little bit of fluff to be perfectly honest with you. It's one of those people, oh, come on, you know, like this, we can all figure it out. Um, and so I happened to be on the board of trustees for my college. And I was there at a meeting, and they were talking about the wellness program. And I was pulled over at all the stuff they were doing at this college for wellness. And I don't know about you, but I look back on college as a lot of fun, and I really didn't need someone else to help me feel well. I thought I did pretty well, man. But they had just incredible programs. And I started to think more and more about that. But if they have all of those programs, here we are in an incredibly high-stress situation. Um, we know that last year there were a number of resident suicides throughout the country, and really, I didn't feel like we were doing anything to help you with wellness. So that's kind of where this came from. Um, then I was trying to think of how I could do this on little to no budget. And then we found Brittany. So Brittany is, um, well, you can talk about what you do with medical school, but Brittany is getting her master's degree in wellness and lifestyle management. So Brittany um, was able to help us with her master's project, and she's been the driver behind some of the, the things that we're going to show you. Dr. Chicheo has a huge interest in wellness and trying to look at medicine not only from sort of the facts, but, but from music, from art. What are some other things that we need to do? So I'm going to turn the mic over to them. They're going to tell you about some of the things we've put together. Um, and then we'll finish that up and hand it over to you. People can briefly, I know it's uh, kind of a long work day for you guys. Um, so there's a multi pronged approach here. So one thing that Dr. Smith is really very supportive of is um, giving you guys two half days per year to do your own therapy. So there's a lot of research out there that doctors do not take care of themselves. That is why there's the adage that it should feel like her. So those half day sessions are meant for you to make your GP appointments, follow up with dental visits, hold time, whatever it is, you need to get a massage or the day, whatever that, whatever you need for your health taking and they'll tell you those two that would work out with your program director when those two that days will be. So that's really meant for you to take care of yourself. Um, there's a couple of other initiatives that we're working on. So Brittany has helped to build this, the beginnings of this beautiful website. There's a lot of things going on with mental in terms of um, yoga and, um, and other exercise classes. So this is um, the link from that website that you can pull up continually. It will always be updated with um, activities that are going on, whether it's um, food truck, whether it's yoga tests. We're also working on bringing some of those over here so that when you're on call and you can't actually leave the building, um, we can hopefully bring some of those yoga sessions and other activities um, while you're physically stuck here. Um, and also, going back, um, there is a link. So this is the wellness calendar of events. This is for you. So when you go to this link, and again, this is just the very beginning of it, 
um, the tricky thing we're talking about. It'll go through several different um, aspects of resident wellness. And, and again, there'll be a lot more links um, to be made so that it's interactive. There'll be um, links here for primary care so that you can easily follow up with your primary care provider. I know the Ripo Women's Health Center has been very actively trying to recruit any female physicians who need to have um, follow up and we'll be doing something similar for the other half of the population as well. Um, behavioral health is also very important, so we have links for um, EAP and we'll be building that out as well. There'll be some free online resources for exercise, um, of course, it's very important. We'll be building out more and more food options. Um, there's something to say that already happens at the medical school. Um, we have a class now, and I believe that the next um, one of the upcoming sessions will be giving you guys um, water bottles that you can carry around with you so that you don't get dehydrated and hyperdemic when you're grounding for 12 hours. <laughs> um, and there'll be a few more aspects because it's building on more cultural events in the area that you want to be looking all over if you want to go to a performance or an opera or the museum, something else that's ready to feed your soul aside from just reading the news that you really need to be a well rounded physician and not just someone who is purely a technician. <coughs> Sure. So, um, so I'm the course director for the, the selectives in the medical humanities at the med school. And a lot of what we do there is be very applicable to residents and attending as well. So we started doing the art of observation, um, which is where we actually go into the gallery. We go into um, the Pennsylvania Academy for the, the fine arts. And we do sessions where we try to hone our observational skills. We look at objects maybe we're not that familiar with, like very complex narrative um, paintings, American artwork. And we really have to um, be completely unbiased and really just um, look at and, and what we're seeing through visual inventories and approach things with a completely blank slate. So I think that has been very helpful for us and we sort of participate in it too. So we're going to try to offer that, um, or it will be to all the other residents. The internal medicine residents did it last year, our, our third year, and they loved it. They thought it was a great bonding experience. So um, we have a lot of support to broaden that to um, groups of everyone. So that's just some of the things. Um, I'll give it over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Gotch, and I am actually a development coordinator over at the medical school across the street. And I'm working towards um, getting my master's in wellness and lifestyle management. And my boss, Patty Manson, um, who's also in development, uh, met with me when I started two years ago, and we saw a real need for wellness in our medical students. And then as I started creating my project and thinking of ideas for my masters, um, Dr. Spavitz and Dr. Trecheo came along and they said that we really need wellness here at the hospital. So as you saw before, um, our wellness is www.cmsrufitmd.com. It's really a work in progress right now. Um, roughly, I'm looking around January for a full launch of the website. But you'll see that we have things listed on our calendar of events. Um, every month we update that to the medical school. So like they said, we have food truck Tuesday, so in our parking lot behind our building. Um, every two weeks we try to offer different food options for you. Um, I'm really big on providing fresh fruit and vegetables and things like that. So I'm really working with vendors right now to get them to you guys um, and, and share our vendors and our resources for that. Um, so. If there's anything that we can do at the medical school to help you, we have a small little fitness center. Um, we're also working, um, there's one resident right now, I can't remember her name, but we're working to schedule um, different classes and things for you here as well as there. I know it's very technically and busy for you, but um, if there's anything that we can help you with over at the medical school to bring here, I'd be happy to help. Um, that's it. Thank you. Yes. Are we allowed to use that fitness center? Yes. For free. Well, it's, or, it's not a gym, oh, okay. it's more of a wellness room. So in that oh, okay. room, there's no cardio equipment, but we have you know, small weights, we have punching bags, we have pull-up bars, all sorts of stuff. So um, our students have 24-hour access to that building, but I don't see why we couldn't give you just the equal access to that. So. Yeah, there's also the talk center, which is like a mile away. Yeah, there, there's the Croc Center, um, which is a beautiful um, pool gym and swimming pool that is like $25 a month or so. It's $12. $12 a month. It's really cheap. We're on Harrison Ave, so it's yeah. five minutes from here. It, it, was, it is absolutely gorgeous, if any of you have not thought about it.
But it's absolutely gorgeous. It really is in Camden. It's about five minutes. Um, and I think it's somewhere around $12 a month. Um, it's really very cheap. So the last thing I'll say, and then I'll let Dr. Mazzarella take over. So we've been, we've been thinking about a wellness day or a wellness evening. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. But we thought that sometime in the January, February time frame when it's dark and everyone's depressed, um, <laughs> we're going to do, um, we're going to do a, a probably late afternoon, evening, different things for you. We'll, we'll probably have some massage people up here. We're going to do maybe some yoga. We'll do some food. We'll do some different things, just sort of focusing on wellness. So I don't have the date for that yet, but we will do it. And, uh, you know, again, participate. Because if we do all this stuff and no one participates, Sort of doesn't make any sense. So, so anyway, um, thank you all, and you guys are good. Any other questions? Yes. Um, kind of a question, kind of a comment, but I'm not sure how other programs are doing it. But for medicine, we get food trays every night, and it's consisting of like a whole bunch of sandwiches that we really don't eat, like chips and things like that. Um, I have reached out to some of the people who administer the food and I've been breaking a lot of barriers to get like more healthy options like salads and things that we'll you know eat. Um, I don't know who will be able to help me out with that but I've been communicating for months and nothing has really come about it. Okay. Um, Krista you want to I'll take that one? <laughs> I mean if you run into any barriers let me know. But maybe do it for us. Okay. Yeah. Any way you can get pediatric food. <laughs> <laughs> so that is something that I, I do want to look into because, um, you know, I get it. You're working at night. You may not be able to get to the cafeteria. So um, I don't have a promise on that yet, but but we're going to try to work those things out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, before I start and introduce myself, how many of you were at the last uh, core lecture series, the Jay Kaplan? Raise your hand if you were at that. Lower the expectations, because that dude was really good. So, um, so my name's Anthony Mazzarelli. I'm the chief physician executive here at Cooper. Um, and a little background about myself. So I grew up in South Jersey um, and grew up here went to college in the South and then came back to Robert Wood Johnson for medical school, came to the Camden campus, and then did a joint program in the Camden campus for medical school and then University of Pennsylvania for law school and my master's in bioethics. I then stayed here for my residency in emergency medicine and then stayed on as a faculty member. And I still practice in the emergency department, not that often, um, but then I'm also mostly uh, full-time up here in administration. So I'm very excited to be here with you. Most of you, um, I probably gave your um, intro to Camden talk when you first started, so um, this is my second time getting to interact with you, and so here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll talk for a little while. Um, how much time? I don't know what, how much time we have. What time? No, it's, it's 520 now. What time is this? 630, okay. A good, uh, a good meeting in my mind ends on time. A great meeting ends early, so. Uh, I'll try to get us head a little early. So we'll talk for a while. Then I'll let you give some, um, ask some questions. Um, my goal is to keep you somewhat, to keep you engaged, right? So there are a lot of things I'm going to kind of ask you questions about. If you've seen this talk before, because I give versions or flavors of it in some of the residency programs. I did it with OBGYN a week or so ago. And you know some of the sort of trivia questions. Don't shout it out if you already heard the talk. Don't be like that person. We all went to med school with that person, so some of you are in here, I know that. Uh, so don't do that. Um, so here's what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about healthcare. We're gonna talk about the state of healthcare in the US healthcare system. And I apologize in advance, because we've got two sides of the room, so I'll try to kind of wander back and forth. I wanna give a little introduction first about healthcare in general. Um, and oh, by the way, I know you have your cell phones or whatever, and you know, if you just put them on silent, um, I know that I just have to compete with the entire internet. Like if I could be more engaging, in the entire internet that you'll pay attention. So, um, so Peter Drucker is a pretty famous organizational development guy. He's not a healthcare person who said this, even small healthcare institutions are complex, barely manageable places. Large healthcare organizations may be the most complex organizations in human history. 
So the most complex thing in human history is what we're going to talk about today. I'll give you a little introduction. We'll talk about the healthcare landscape today, a lot about money and finances. Um, and then I'll give you sort of my prescription for the required competencies to be successful in where healthcare is going, if we have time. Uh, and then we'll take some questions. So there's a lot of different stakeholders, right? A lot of stakeholders in the healthcare system. And if you think about it, these are, these are really the pieces, right? You have patients, you have physicians, you have providers, so other providers other than physicians, hospitals, nurses, advanced care providers. You have the payers or the insurance companies. You have pharma, right, pharma and device companies. But I'm gonna try to convince you that there's another party that we don't think about a lot, or at least you probably don't think about, that is a major influencer in healthcare. And the other piece is employers, large employers. Employers who buy healthcare in bulk for their employees as a major influence of the system. We'll talk about that. There's a lot of money in the US healthcare system. How much money? If you just took the US healthcare sector by itself, it's the seventh largest economy in the world. Right? That's pretty massive. Right? That's, there's a lot of money in this. Um, I have this slide in almost every talk. It's like a triple aim slide. Because that, that, that slide will be later, because you always have the triple aim in, is to think about healthcare in this way, right? There's resources. There's your physical resources. Um, that's your equipment. That's you know, your computers. It's, it's the hospital. It's, every, it's all the actual equipment. There's human resources, right? There's people. And then there's your digital resources, your electronic resources. Those are the components. And then there's everything you want to do. And everything in the middle is just processes, right? It's how do you put these and fit these pieces together? Um, and it's something to just kind of always think about as, you, as we start to think about how money is spent in the US healthcare system. So a lot of times people talk about success is the enemy of innovation. I will make the argument to you that we do not have a lot of innovation in medicine. And in fact, you know who the gods want to destroy? They first send 40 years of prosperity. That change is slow in healthcare, partly because there's enough success in healthcare. And so, what do I mean by innovation? Well, we'll, we'll go to the, come back to that in a second. What do you think of when you think of the company on the left? What company is that? What do you think of when you think of Apple? What comes to mind? What words describe that company? Success, sleek. What else? Innovative, right? Yeah, when you see Tim Cook, he's not talking about um, you know, what they have now. He's talking about the next thing they're going to do. right? Every other day, there's an article about Apple's going to make a car, and Apple's going to do this, and Apple's going to do that. right? It's always about the future. What do you think of when you think of Kodak? But does, anyone, has anyone never heard of Kodak? Because that's I'm, there's a point where that's going to be the case, right? Well, what does Kodak do as a company? Cameras, Cameras right? So Co Kodak has filed for bankruptcy, right? What was the problem with Kodak? Why were they outdated? How did they get, how did they get, they resisted digital, right? They said, well, because they were the leader in photography. And they saw themselves as being in the film business, not in, not in the, you know, in the photo business. And they had a confirmation bias as digital technology started to roll out. They had this confirmation bias where they only believed the signals in the world that conform with their view that they were a, really a photo company and not a, a, a company, a film company. So they waited too long to change. And if you wait too long to change and innovate, you can be left out. So what's another famous example? What in like five years, no one's ever going to hurt a Kodak. So what, what's the company I could put up here instead? Who? Canon. Canon, maybe, but who else? Another industry. Blackberry. Blackberry, actually, that's correct. I can, what else? I, I have a special spot in my heart for this company because it's the first job I ever had. Blockbuster Video, right? How many of you have heard of Blockbuster Video, right? So Blockbuster Video, I can tell you because I worked there, my first job, their entire business model was based on late fees. The entire business model. How many, it, it was, how many midnights, and they were always changing it because they wanted to confuse you so that you would always be late, right? It was fees for not rewinding. And then Netflix came along, right? And Netflix would come along, 
And Netflix gave all this stuff, no late fees. That was Netflix thing. And Blockbuster resisted and resisted. And by the time Blockbuster went under, it had online streaming, just like Netflix. But it was too late, right? It waited too long. There are major changes in healthcare, and I'm gonna to try to prove to you over our time together those changes are coming. And if, if organizations and physicians don't adapt, you're gonna be the next Kodak or you're gonna be the next Blockbuster. So, by the way, this dude, this is Steve Sassone, is his name. He's the inventor of the digital camera. What company did he work for when he invented the digital camera? Kodak. So let's talk about technology. So typically, technology usually originates from outside forces, and it helps you deliver products at a better quality at a lower cost, right? And better quality, lower cost, something you're going to hear me talk about all night. And also, technology usually simplifies things. Banks. Banks used to literally be these big, you know, columned places, big marble, um, la you know, uh, lobbies. And then what happened? What came at? What, what technology came along that allowed them to streamline and deliver services more simply and at a higher quality, the lower cost? Now you're skipping a couple steps. You're showing you're showing your age, or I'm showing my age. So drive-through, right? They had the, the vacuum, the suction thing, like the labs, like the nurses do at the labs, right? And they still have that, and you can just drive up. So you didn't even need to get out of your car, right? And then the next technology step were ATMs. Now, you can just do it right from your phone or your computer, right? Well, medical technology is incredibly advanced, right? The things we can do, we can replace your aortic valve by, you know, without ever even having to open your chest. Information technology in healthcare, I argue, is really far behind. If you're ever in a scavenger hunt and you have to find carbon paper, just go to the nearest hospital. Because they're the only people that still have those kinds of things around, right? So you have to ask yourself, what is it about the financial forces in healthcare that we haven't had innovation in the same way as other industries? I mean, if, if we did this, you should be able to, to do an x-ray with your smartphone, right? But kind of what happens is X, then you develop CAT scan, and then CAT scan, then MRI, and the machines keep getting more expensive, more expensive, um, and those margins stay up, and we'll talk about that. So, all right, so let's talk about, with all those things in the back of your mind, let's talk about the healthcare landscape. So, the, I'm gonna try to prove to you that the current system is unsustainable. Now, everybody who's ever given a talk on healthcare to a group of people about the current healthcare system any year forever has had a slide that said the current system is unsustainable. I'm gonna to try to prove to you that this time I'm right. So the first thing is that the size of the federal budget deficit's unsustainable. It's a larger percentage than it ever was before, and I'll show you a couple data points on that. That the annual increase in Medicare budget is unsustainable. So those two factors are different than it's been in the past. The amount of money we spend on health care isn't going to be sustainable. What programs reimburse won't be either. And there'll continue to be a transfer of costs to employers and consumers. In other words, those that purchase health care will continue to, to pay more uh, for the same amount of care. In other words, the old model's gone and things are going to change. Here's a couple data points. I won't walk through them. But certainly, um, there are a lot of aspects of the healthcare system that would make people think it's not particularly a well-oiled machine. So here's my first point to try to prove to you um, that things are kind of unsustainable. If you think of just Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, right, um, and defense, that eats up most of what we spend our money on. I mean, non, other non-interest spending is one category. If you think about it, you constantly hear politicians on TV fighting and debating whether you watch Fox or MSNBC, CNN, about like this, about spending on something like this, right? Whereas it's like, other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play, right? Like, this is where all the spending is going. And if you project it out over time, and you just look at the, if you just look at those entitlements, Medicare really, really starts to jump out to the point where like, if this went out to the year 3000, there's just two people in the world, people using Medicare and people providing Medicare, right? Like, so this is not going to be sustainable. Now, this graph along the bottom is income per person, okay, per capita. And on the side is total health spending. And each of these are different countries. So this is the United States. 
So we have a, a lot of health spending, and every, you've seen a million articles that talk about healthcare spending. And we're pretty far up there as far as income. And this is the year 2000. If I march you through from 2000 to 2010, what do you think is going to happen to this dot? It's going to go, is it going to go up and out, up and over? You think it's going to go up and left. So here's what it does, OK? As you go over time, it just goes pretty much straight up. So what does that mean? It means we're spending, people are not making any more money, but we're spending much, much more on health care. Makes it unsustainable. Here's another idea, way to, here's my other proof point. See if you'll accept this sort of philosophically. Republicans and Democrats agree on nothing, right? Nothing. They agree that the healthcare system is broken. Before Affordable Care Act, even afterwards, everyone agrees that spending in healthcare is a problem. Everybody. So they don't agree how to fix it, very far from it. Uh, but even the Republicans didn't argue that the afford they argued against Affordable Care Act. They didn't argue that there's nothing wrong with our system, right? So like we talked about, there's a lot of money in healthcare. And employers are really that missing element. We'll talk about employers in a minute. How many of you remember or have ever heard of this particular publication to Err is Human from the Institute of Medicine? Have you ever heard of it? It's pretty famous. It came out, I think it was 1998, said, or in the 90s, said there were like 98,000 people a year that die from preventable uh, uh, events in hospitals. Made a big splash. They had a follow up um, crossing the quality chasm. And in that follow up, you know, kind of a big splash. And I think a lot of people say that there's some credibility with the Institute of Medicine. Well, their newest publication, which isn't talked about that much, really starts to look at spending and waste in healthcare. So this is, I think, a pretty powerful slide in which the average US salary has gone up around 38% in this 10-year period. Not a very high number, you know? But healthcare, pre you know, because inflation would be included in all this, healthcare premiums have gone up 131%. So if you, if what you bring in is the same and your spending goes up, right, that's going to be an unsustainable trajectory. It would be the same as if during that time period now a dozen eggs cost $55 or a gallon of milk $48. That's what is happening to healthcare. So employers who buy healthcare for their employees are now spending an unbelievable amount more money. They're literally doing this equivalent in order to make sure that they can provide health care to people. That's not sustainable. So does anyone want to argue there's not waste in health care? Right? Are we a well-oiled machine with no waste? Right? So people have tried to quantify it. And if I sat here and didn't show you the slide, people would give all kinds of, they all want, everyone wants a silver bullet. Right? You want to say, well, I think it's because we get sued. It's the lawyers. Right? Or I think it's because we overtask it. Here's the bottom line. There's lots of ways in which there is waste in healthcare. Waste is the new oil. There are, there are hundreds of entrepreneurial companies. And you know this, right? Because there's like some person you went to med school with who left med school to do a startup, and they're making money off of this. All these guys, every week I have companies that contact me that want to talk to Cooper about how we can stop wasting money, right? Um, now, the spending growth did go down a little bit. Now, that doesn't mean we didn't have an increase in spending. The acceleration of spending did drop a little bit before the start of the Affordable Care Act. And a lot of economists have written about it. No one really has settled on exactly why. So let's talk about this. The US spends more per capita than any other country on health care. You've seen this slide before, some version of it, or someone's told you this. And so is that a problem? Who wants to argue? Give me the argument on why it's not a problem. You don't have to believe it, but how would, if someone had to give the argument against saying, no, I'm OK with that slide? Better off yeah, if the juice is worth the squeeze, right? So if maybe everyone's better off, maybe we're worth, it's worth paying them more. Is it? Well, how would you judge it? Life ah, life expectancy. So. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of take the position, I don't think life expectancy is the best marker of your healthcare system. Here's why. What's the leading cause of death of men 18 to 44 in Camden? Right, it's homicide. So it's not really a marker of your healthcare system, right? So 
the things that are better markers are things like your five-year survival rate from colon cancer or your five-year survival rate from having some kind of disease. How does the U.S. compare there? Is the juice worth the squeeze then? No, right? So um, we have a lot of money in our healthcare system that we're spending and not necessarily getting the outcomes we want. All right, so the pretty famous diagram called the Fishbeck diagram. I want to see if you can guess what the x-axis is. So the y-axis is spending, OK? Each one of these groupings is comparing these five countries. So the US is being compared to the five other countries. What do you think the x-axis is? What, what, what's your guess? Life expectancy. Life expectancy, OK. What? Different diseases, it's a good guess. All right, it's age. So think about this slide coupled with this slide, right? Until you get into your 60s, the US pretty much spends the same amount of money as everyone else. It's when you're later in life and spending at the end of life where the US really starts to become an outlier, right? And the cynic would say, that's kind of interesting. That looks exactly like the curve for the percent of people that vote, right? <laughs> um, all right, so we have to talk about excessive pricing because this article by Stephen Brill comes out in Time Magazine called The Bitter Pill. Um, talks about, really focuses on MD Anderson. It also mentions, a little shout out to Virtua there, um, in which they talk about the charge master, right? And everyone talks about, the charge master and how high and exorbitant charges are. Right? Does everyone know what the charge master is? So for everything that you would purchase in healthcare at any healthcare institution, there is basically the menu. And it's what we say the charges are for everything we do. So you recognize that picture? Because that looks like the exact same brand we use at Cooper, right? So for a pack of gauze, if I go online right now, I can go to Total Home Care Supplies. And I can get one of those for $3.85. What do you think MD Anderson, because they were featured in the article, charges patients for a box like that? $10. $10, that's your guess? Yeah, it's $77. Right? Seems crazy, right? Seems crazy. What do you think, the, what, what do you think it is at Cooper? So who was it was talking about uh, trying to email about the food fixing? Right, so like, like four months and 15 emails after saying, what's this number of Cooper? I finally got, it's probably around $37, okay? Now we don't charge patients this way, so that's why they had to do some gymnastics to figure it out. And this is of course MD Anderson's answer, which is basically, they don't do anything different than anyone else. So why is this, right? Because this, I, there's no, I, I can't think of a better term and forgive the crudeness, but the media writes about this every other day. This is medical pricing porn. They cannot get enough of this, right? So it is literally every other day. There was an article yesterday about doing this with, with uh, radiology. There's a, you know, there'll be an article coming up about ultrasound. I mean, they're all the time, right? And all it does is it looks at the charge master. So let me explain to you why I, I'm, the charge master to me is a problem, but it's a symptom of the disease, not the disease itself. And here's how it works. Let's say an aspirin costs a dollar. It doesn't, right? Let's just say it costs a dollar. If an aspirin costs a dollar and Medicaid reimburses us 17 cents on the dollar for an aspirin, well, then we got to charge everyone else a little bit more to make up for the fact that we lose money every time we give a Medicaid patient an aspirin. And then it turns out maybe Medicare pays us 85 cents for an aspirin. Well, there's a few, now we have to raise the price even more because we have to make up for the fact that every time we give an aspirin out to a Medicare or Medicaid patient, we lose money. So then Horizon comes along as an insurer and says, you know, hey, I'll point my 700,000 covered lives towards you if you give me a discount on stuff. And we'll say, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, give, we'll give you a 20% discount. So now you got to make the aspirin 
even more expensive, so at the 20% discount, it makes up for the 85% of the 17%. Then you have to play that same game with every single insurance company. And by the time you're done, it's like a $17 aspirin, right? Now, no one's paying $17, except for who? The uninsured. Who? The uninsured. The uninsured, except, to be fair, they're not, right? That's the porn aspect where everyone writes this. So every single one of these healthcare, if you just call, you can pay out of pocket at the Medicare rate. Almost every hospital in the country, but they make you ask, right? They make you ask. Um, either way, it's still confusing. It's not transparent to people. So if they're gonna, if typical market forces are gonna have people choose where they go, the charge master is incredibly misleading. So I, I agree with Brill's basic premise that there's problems and there's, there's lots of waste in healthcare and there's misaligned incentives and the charge master is a problem. I just think it's a symptom of the overall problem. So, but that's the answer to why things are so expensive. Here's the other problem. We never agree on costs, right? So the word cost, what does that mean? If you're able to do an incredibly good physical exam and take a history on a patient who has a chief complaint of back pain, and you can save from doing an MRI, what's the cost savings? Well, you're gonna have trouble answering that, because here's why. Do you mean the cost savings to the patient? Do you mean the cost savings to the insurance company? Do you mean the cost savings to Cooper of not doing one additional MRI? Do you mean the cost, right? So cost is a relative term. Right? If I went back to the slide where I showed you the gauze for 239, and I said to you, how much does it cost Cooper to get gauze? You're gonna, you would have said a number that's less than 239, which it is, right? Because we buy in bulk and we have, so cost is always relative. And when you have pundits on TV talking about the healthcare system, they're constantly mixing up what they mean by costs. All right, do you know who this dude is? Who is he? By the way, this is the, um, this is the like, obligatory slide to, sh to make it look like it's a brand new PowerPoint deck because it just is from like, it's from like a couple weeks ago. Um, even though I've, you know, I've been giving the talk for a while. Who is this guy? His name's Martin Shkreli. That's right, right? So he's a guy that bought a company that sells a drug that treats toxo, toxoplasmosis, and for the ID people, I'm sure I'll mess this up, but he buys the drug, it treats Toxo, and it was being sold for uh, $13.50, and he immediately jacked up the price to $7.50 per pill, um, and the media picked up on this, and everyone said he's a pariah, he's like the worst dude in the world. He didn't help himself because he does this kind of thing, <laughs> right? He, he, tells, he, tells, he calls reporters names and shouts at them, um, and so here's the reality, though. This happens every day. It happens all the time. The only reason why this got picked up in the media is because this dude acts this way. <laughs> now, the argument on the other side is that if he doesn't buy the company, the drug doesn't get made anymore. So essentially, he, he says, look, I, I bought the company. This is what it costs to make the drug stick around. We could let the company fail because there's so few people that have this disease. Um, but if, you know, if that happens, wouldn't you rather have it around than not have it around, right? I'm not sure I buy that argument, but that's the argument he makes. But it's another example of, you don't hear that side. Every article you read, it's just how this dude is the worst, and people on Facebook wanna, you know, wanna kill him, and, and he's, but you don't hear sort of the flip side discussion, right? So this is a great article. So Atul Gawande is a Harvard surgeon, writes in the New Yorker. He's got three really big landmark articles. The first is called The, um, the Hot Spotters, which is actually partially about Cooper. Because Jeff Brenner, our own Jeff Brenner, who started the Camden Care Coalition, it's very much about what he does and what we do in urban health initiatives and what he does with the Camden Care Coalition. So I refer you to the hot spotters. But the second big article Gawande did that caught a lot of attention um, was this article called The Cost Conundrum, where he looks at the Dartmouth Atlas, which is spending at the end of life, Medicare spending at the end of life, which does have some issues. A lot of people now sort of counter the Dartmouth Atlas. but. And he looks at two towns in Texas that are demographically almost identical, right? So socioeconomics and uh, overall demographics and race, everything's the same. But Medicare spending at the end of life is dramatically higher in one over the other. And when he goes and he looks, what he, what he typically finds is that 
the reason why is that in the one town they have more interventional cardiologists, more neurosurgeons, and they have all these specialists, and that when you have a hammer, the world looks like a nail. So that his theory is that um, th these decisions aren't being made necessarily always on evidence, and that there tends to be the opposite of supply and demand, where actually supply garnishes more demand. Right? That's just there's then he writes an article called Big Met, where and this is an interesting article as well, where he talks about the Cheesecake Factory. So how many of you have been to the Cheesecake Factory? You've all been to the Cheesecake You've all carried the beeper, <laughs> right? You've all carried the beeper. Um, and what he talks about is how the Cheesecake Factory has this incredibly big menu. And no matter whether you go to a Cheesecake Factory in New Jersey or in Texas or in California, the you know, Parmesan crusted chicken tastes exactly the same. And it looks exactly the same. And why is it that, that they're able to deliver quality, that, the, that they're able to, the Cheesecake Factory can deliver reproducible, low variation, same quality, but the same thing can't happen in things in healthcare, like knee replacements. That there's an incredible amount of variation when it comes to knee replacements in length of stay and uh, in complication rates, even when you match for demographics. So he sort of makes the point that there's a lot of variation and kind of goes along with his theories um, in the cost conundrum. So don't worry about the rest of this slide. Let's look at this area up here. So what this slide is basically saying is that you can look at inpatient use rates. So over time, you can look at, in 2011, there were basically about 122 inpatient admissions per 1,000 people in the United States in a loosely managed market versus 84 in a tightly managed market. So, well, what's the, what do you mean by that? It's all, it means consolidation, right? So a tightly managed market means everybody is essentially, you know, it would be the Geisinger where they're basically a monopoly. Atlantic Care down the shore is essentially a monopoly. That's a tightly managed market. We, we couldn't be less of a, of a tightly managed market, right? We're a loosely managed market. I can literally open the shades and you can look at like three other academic medical centers, right? So what do you think, in 2011, what do you think this number was in South Jersey? If 122 is sort of the high side and 84 is the low side, what was this number? Because we get good data on this. 142. And the prediction is that this number will go down and that as you take utilization down, because of the way healthcare will be reimbursed and because there's waste in the system, if you can get that waste out, that you will start to see a decline in the number of inpatient visits. And we'll talk about that. And sort of the tide pod theory, if you, if you run across this. So how many of you use tide pods? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? How many of you don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> so where's a tide pod user? Explain what it is. Yeah, when you're washing your clothes. So what is it? Yeah, and it comes in a little pod, right? If you didn't use Tide Pod, how would you measure your detergent? In a cup, right? Have you ever noticed that the cups were gigantic? The lids were gigantic, but the cup for the detergent was smaller, right? So that was the traditional way. Well, Tide comes along with the Tide Pods. That was supposed to be for convenience, right? For ease. You don't have to measure out. We're, you know, we're, we want everything on demand. And for the first time ever in sales in the detergent industry, sales went down. For the first time ever, why? Tide pods went up, overall sales went down, why? Less waste, right? The whole, the whole thing is if you have better utilization and you have the right utilization, then you'll have waste and it'll go down, right? And so that's the issue you're going to have. If you can control utilization, and, you're, and we'll talk about why I think that may happen or what experts are saying may happen, you'll have overall less money in the healthcare system. So we talked about this. That was sort of my proof to give you the burning platform, right, um, of why I think it's unsustainable. So what's going to happen in healthcare? Well, first, you're going to have a lot of provider, meaning you know, physicians and also hospitals and healthcare organizations, under a lot of pressure as people start to migrate towards value-based payments, right? Traditionally, hospitals and doctors, we are not in the business of healthcare. We are in the business of sick care. We get paid when people are sick. 
There's an attending in the emergency department and when patients say, can I go out for a smoke? He says, yeah, go ahead, it's good for business. <laughs> Insurance companies are in the business of healthcare. They make money when people are healthy, right? So if you start to pay physicians based on value, because right now, most of the time we get paid for volume, right? Number of clicks, right? Not for actually how well we do. And that is starting to change, and I'll talk about why. What will happen with everything I showed you and with changing reimbursement is that inpatient and outpatient rates will decline. You're going to see a big push for operations improvement in healthcare. There will be a push towards removing variation and waste. Order sets will become the law of the land. It's been universally shown that if you standardize care in healthcare, the amount of utilization goes down. You never standardize to do more. It always ends up doing less when you, do stand, when you standardize things. There are healthcare systems across the US. The only way you can order things are in order sets because they use the power of defaults. And you know, all of a sudden, you know, I, I have a, a case the other day. I remember I was in the emergency department a few months ago. And we had a, one of our best third year residents who stayed on as a faculty member. And he was, it was early in his third year, so it was a while, maybe it was over a year ago. And I, I remember hearing him and he was presenting a case. And he says, uh, it's, a, it's a stroke case or a potential stroke case. And it was right at the time they started pushing the, that we had to do the swallowing study or else you get dinged on the core measure, right? So he says uh, to the attending, and you'll be proud of me, I remembered to put in the swallowing study. I was not proud of him. I was embarrassed, not of him, but of us as healthcare. Why? If it's really that important, why would we make people memorize that? Right? Like, why, why would we want you to have to remember to do the swallowing study? It should be in an order set that's defaulted, that when you have a stroke patient, it reminds you what you need to do. Right? The idea that you're going to hold all this in your head doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it was easy when the only choices in healthcare, you know, 70 years ago were leeches, right, and penicillin. <laughs> There's no way you can keep up quality and, and be standardized without using things like the EMR and order sets. So I'm telling you that's coming. In the future, some people say, you, I won't even need to look at outcomes. Just give me variance reports. Because I, if I know the process is right, I only need to know if you varied from the process. Because the out, I'll get the outcomes I want. So this is going to be a huge push. Now, the pushback from physicians is always the same. If I say, look, you should use order sets, order sets, order sets, what, what is, are we going to have some physicians going to push back and say what? All patients are different. All patients are different. What else? Oh, you're making me practice cookbook, cookbook medicine, right? Let me tell you, here's my response, my witty response. Even the best chefs use a recipe, right? So this is the wave of the future. This is how things are going to be done. Scale is going to become essential. Size is going to matter beyond belief. What they say is you need about three to five billion in scale as a healthcare organization to exist in the future world. You need that scale. That's how you can have enough patients because if utilization goes down, you need more patients to keep the same margin up. So if you think about South Jersey, if you need three to five billion, I will tell you that Cooper, Virtua, Lourdes, Inspira, and Kennedy together don't equal five billion. All of us together don't equal five billion. So the competitive landscape will be reshaped. You will see people doing all kinds of things with each other in order to have that, those covered lives be there, and we'll talk about that. And there'll be a new core set of competencies around physicians that's not only about quality, but also about cost. We'll try everything we can not to say the word cheap. Like we'll say, oh, value, you know, it's value. <laughs> but higher, higher quality at a lower cost. Payers and employers will become more price sensitive. Um, and none of this matters about legislation. It doesn't matter if Trump gets elected and they repeal the Affordable Care Act. The cat's out of the bag for pay for value and pay for performance. It's going to happen even if you appeal, repeal the Affordable Care Act. Now, I keep saying, look, you're going to have to compete on quality and cost. But here's the problem with quality. Things are pretty equal. There's not a huge variation on quality, right? So it's, it's basically pretty tight. It's hard to compete on quality uh, when everything's so tight. 
And if the world becomes more price sensitive, because right now it's not as price sensitive, right? Consumers don't often think <laughs> about cost before they choose their healthcare provider. But it's going to change. And physicians often don't think about cost when they refer patients. And insurance companies, as much as you think they, they love money, they don't really push patients around as much as they typically could. And we'll talk about why. But all that's going to change, because all three of those factors will change. Here's an incredible amount of variation with um, orthopedic knee replacement and the incredible variation by surgeon um, based on not only length of stay, but cost per case and complications. Ver lots of variation. So if you look at uh, reform, really the principles are, were to expand the number of people who were insured, reduce costs over time, and really have a push towards value. And there's a bunch of different mechanisms to do that. And these are the things you've kind of heard about, quality incentives, bundled payments, um, and we'll get into these a little bit. So, um, you know, the health system is starting to get penalized for not having better outcomes. Individual physician practices are starting to get penalized. Things that were incentives from the government now become penalties if you don't do them. Um, and this is happening all over the country, and all the different payers are doing it. Right now, I think it was last week, it was either, I think it was either Penn or Virtua, because um, they had announcements we'll talk about, said that 64% of their payer contracts have some kind of pay for performance element to them. So that how you perform matters. Accountable care organizations, everyone's heard of those. They're like unicorns. Everyone can describe them. No one's ever really seen one. Um, and the idea is that, yeah, sure. Are they going to ever really materialize? Yeah, there's some. There's the ACO products from the federal government. Some have showed some savings. But the basic core is there in that you're going to end up shifting some risk. And we'll talk about that. By the way, the government is the number one payer in the world, right? Medicare and Medicaid. And there's people in the government who say, hey, quality is a law enforcement issue, right? If you're lying on charts, if you're, if you're putting things on charts that aren't true, if you're, if you're pushing the limit for medical necessity, we'll put people in jail and find them. It's a law enforcement issue. And they've been beefing up this process. It used to be that the rack they call would only look at hospital side. They're starting to go through and look at the physician side, the professional fees, and whether there's fraud and waste in there, and whether you're really um, documenting what you need to document. So this is my slide has is a, is a quick three points. The number of inpatient discharges is going to go down in the future. The percent of those inpatients that are left are more likely to be government payers and government payers are going to pay less. That's not a great recipe for hospitals, right? So inpatient discharges will go down. Those that are left are more likely to be government payers, and the government's going to pay less. Now, if you look at the little caveat here, it is predicted that tertiary care is projected to grow. And Cooper, that's part of Cooper's sort of plan, is to be the tertiary care provider of choice. There's $2 billion that goes across the bridge. Capturing that complex care is really where Cooper believes its future is, because we do have a lower uh, price point, and we'll talk about that. So these are all the downward pressures, right? Changes in government policy, reduction in utilization, all these things are downward pressures in the margin of a healthcare system or a doctor's practice. Um, and there's some favorable factors, right? The aging population, um, increasing coverage, right? Why did it, how many of you have ever seen Between Two Ferns? It's pretty funny, right? What is, someone explain what Between Two Ferns is. Can you, I want everyone to see what you, the guy who mentioned Zach Galifianakis looks like. Like, stand up. <laughs> um, so Between Two Ferns, Zach Galifianakis, he's the guy from The Hangover. He interviewed Obama on Between Two Ferns. President Obama went on Between Two Ferns. Have any of you ever seen that, right? A scene between two friends. It's a comedy routine. Why did he do that? He went on for one reason. He talked about it in the interview. <coughs> what was he trying to do? To do what? You're right. He was trying to reach out, not to vote, right? It was after he was already. What was he reaching, trying to reach young people to do? To sign up for Obamacare. Why? Because here's the thing, right? Before the Affordable Care Act, you couldn't buy individual insurance. Like, call Horizon, and hey, Horizon, I would like it, but you click, they'll just hang up. 
right? They were in it because they sell to large employers. They didn't sell to individuals. Why didn't they sell to individuals? The selection bias towards sick people, right? The only people that were calling for individual plans were people who were really sick, right? And that selection bias is problematic for insurance companies. So the way to get the insurance companies on board with the Affordable Care Act and the way to, pay, to, to subsidize and pay for it was the government said, hey, here's what we're going to do. We'll, we'll set up these exchanges for people to buy individual plans and then we'll make everybody get health care. If we make everybody get health care and enough young people sign up to avoid the penalty, you could avoid the problem of the selection bias and the healthy people can subsidize the more sick people. And that's why you really had the push to get younger people to sign up. So that's how increasing coverage um, is supposed, that's why it's hard to pick and choose. It's hard to say, look, I really love the Affordable Care Act. I just want to keep the no pre-existing conditions and the, you stay on until you're 26. If you start to choose those things and you start to let the mandate go away, you start to lose the idea of that cross subsidization. So let's talk more about payers and employers. So right now, who bears the risk? In the traditional system, who bears the risk of payment in the interaction in the healthcare system? It's the insurer, right? It's the payer. Because we just get paid for what we do. We're just on a volume play. We do something, we get paid. However, in the future, if we're being paid for performance, then we're going to care about, about how we perform, not only on outcomes, but also total cost of care. We actually can gain share and make more money on total care. So what am I talking about? Well, and by the way, this is changing. Here's what I'm saying. The old system's fee for service, right? There's a unit of service. You get paid a certain price. That's your revenue. Well, now there's sort of a move towards there's a unit of service. Um, there's a price, but if you save money, you get to keep some of it. So CamCare had a, a, a gain sharing contract with United last year, where United said, look, this is all the money um, that we spent on CamCare basis last year. If you can make us spend overall less care, we'll keep, let you keep some of it. Even the care not done at CamCare. So even the care done outside of CamCare, care that's done at Cooper or anywhere else to get those primary care doctors to care about total cost of care, they get some money. So then, if the primary care doctor ends up steering patients to higher value, and you still care about value, right? Because it's pretty, pretty costly to be sick. So you care about quality and cost. Now, doctors make more money if they send people to places where they get higher quality care at a lower cost. Then, you know, some people say, well, there'll be a future where not only is there savings, but you actually lose money if you don't, you know, save on total cost of care, which eventually leads to some people saying, oh, it'll be a whole ACO model, which is, you'll just be capitated. You'll just get a whole bunch of money. And if you can manage patients better, um, you'll make more money, like an insurance company. Now, this is called the Massachusetts Experiment. It's my favorite slide, but you can't read it. But I'll explain it to you. Something happened interesting in Massachusetts, and it's not the fact that they had um, you know, sort of a universal health care rule. What happened in Massachusetts is that the attorney general subpoenaed all the records of every insurance company's payment to every hospital in Massachusetts, every single one, and looked at every single payment from every, every insurance company to every hospital and for se across 17 different DRGs, and then, so diagnostic related groups, so 17 different diagnoses essentially, controlled them for quality, of which basically they were all the same because things are pretty, things are tighter on quality than we ever want to admit. And then uh, posted and looked at their relative cost. So what this is saying is at these hospitals, they're paying, the, the insurance companies are paying, you know, over two times more than what they're paying other hospitals for the same thing at the same quality. Why would an insurance company do that? Why would an insurance company pay Partners in Health or Mass General that's who Partners in Health owns Mass General. Why would they pay Mass General three times more to take a gallbladder out than they would pay a full memorial hospital? Why would an insurance company do that? It seems somewhat irrational, right? Why would they do it? Here's why. Who is the biggest purchaser of health insurance? 
employers. Try buying a healthcare uh, product for your employees in Boston and not include the ability for them to go to Mass General. It's not going to happen. So Mass General knows that. So Mass General negotiates with that leverage to get a higher rate. So the, everyone kind of suspected this was true, but you really couldn't prove it until this came out. So it turns out that for the same things, people pay different rates, partly because there was the leverage. Well, here's what happened. When people saw this, they said, well, hold on a second. You're telling me that I'm the employer, I'm paying 131% more over 10 years in premiums so that my employees can go to Mass General, but they get no better care? And typically, you'd say, well, they still want that for their employees, but as those costs go up, they're starting to be willing to look a little different and say, hey, you know what I might do? Maybe I'll buy a product that's 20 or 30% less, doesn't include Mass General, and then the employees can pay out of pocket for the difference if they want to go to Mass General. And that's the idea of tiered networks or narrow network products. It's the idea of, and this happened very quickly in Boston when this came out, so you have this distort healthcare system saying we're the Walmart of healthcare, right? We're the higher quality, lower cost, and put out insurance products with insurers that, that leave out other areas because finally people were willing to buy it. Employees are feeling so much pressure, they're finally willing to do this. And so you have these narrow networks. Here's uh, one healthcare company. Our census is down by uh, 70 versus two years ago. We're seeing a decrease based on narrow networks. We're getting left out. So you have a more price sensitive employer system purchasing insurance with narrow networks. You have primary care physicians on risk where they want higher value to lower cost. And so you start to have this sort of perfect storm of people who will become more price sensitive. For the first time, I, I, it, is, it was crazy. I had the first patient within the last two years say to me, I don't want to be OBS. I was like, you, you know the difference between inpatient and observation? He goes, I don't really. Like the Milliman thing's this big, and I just, um, and it turns out it's because observations and outpatient status, it's a higher copay. And this patient actually knew that, right? So, you know, it also is shaping the competitive landscape because with this risk shifting going back and forth, you have payers who say, I think I can actually, you know, now kind of own the providers. And providers saying, hey, I'd rather be a payer. And all kinds of interesting people, when you take money out of a system, um, start to get together, right? Um, and you have a convergence of payers and providers, including Cooper. Right, Cooper purchased 25% of AmeriHealth, uh, and we're kind of in that game too. We put a product on the exchange in New Jersey when the, the exchanges came out. What does this lead to? It leads to that in the future, there's really only three groups of hospitals, right? Or three groups of providers. There's some contracted providers, psychiatry does this a lot, where they get paid to be you know, the service provider for you know, a college. There's some of that, and that'll stay. And there's really only two categories. There'll be those, you'll get paid, Cooper will manage covered lives. They'll be in our primary care practice, there'll be covered lives, where we'll have some kind of value contract, we'll have some kind of cost sharing, and it'll be on us to think about the cradle to grave services to give high quality care at a lower cost, right? <coughs> but then the third area is that we're gonna be a vendor. We're gonna be just the tertiary care provider for other people who manage covered lives. So the Kennedy Health Alliance down at Kennedy, or Rowan SOM, or the Virtua Medical Group, they don't do CT surgery at those places. They need to choose a vendor, right? And that vendor is either gonna be us, Lords, Penn, Jeff, Temple, and how do we compete? Well, I would love to claim we're gonna compete on quality, but the quality's pretty crowded. And if those people who are referring patients actually make more money, they're gonna to start to be price sensitive just like the consumers, because you gotta get in the narrow networks, and you say, look, our claim is that we're gonna be the higher quality uh, provider at a lower cost. So being the vendor of choice is gonna be very important. So, the old order is volume, the new order is value, timing matters, right? You wanna be Apple, you wanna be Netflix, but you don't wanna to go too soon, right? Because what happens if you go too soon? Well, let me give you an example. How many of you have heard of Virginia Mason? Anybody from Seattle in here? 
So Virginia Mason is a uh, healthcare system in Seattle who got a phone call a couple years ago. Let's get the microphone got snagged. A phone call a couple years ago from Starbucks. Actually, from the TPA administrator who gives out, you know, who does the insurance. Starbucks is a major employer in Seattle. And um, Virginia Mason gets a call and says, they say, listen, we're thinking about leaving you out of our network. You're way too expensive. So the CMO and CEO of Virginia Mason rush into this meeting. They say, look, don't leave us out. We, we want to cut costs. We're a Lean Six Sigma institution. We can do it. We've already done a lot of stuff with Lean. What's, what's the biggest pain point? What's the thing that you spend a lot of money on you think you're an outlier on? We'll fix it. And they said, what do you think it was? What's the, what's the leading cause of missed work in the US? What is it? Number one cause of missed work days. What is it? Someone said it. Say it louder. Back pain. Back pain, right? Back. We have a problem with back pain. So, OK. So Virginia Mason has all their lean people, and they, they redesigned the whole thing. What's the only, although it's been in the news as not, but traditionally, what's been considered the, the first line treatment for non-complicated acute low back pain? What is it? No, someone said it. Physical therapy, right? So Virginia Mason um, you know, says, look, no sacred cows. You know, we're going we're gonna to revamp everything in our back pain center. So here's how it's going to work. When you have your first appointment, the first you're going to, we're going to tell you to bring gym clothes, and the first person you're going to see is a physical therapist. The physical therapist is going to interview you, and if in an algorithm that's standard, in a protocol, if you have non-complicated back pain, then the physical therapist presents your case to either the orthopedic surgeon or the sports medicine guy, and then at that appointment right there, they start physical therapy. And it worked. They lowered the cost dramatically of treating patients for, for back pain. Because what typically happens prior to physical therapy if you go into a back pain center? They'll see you, they'll give you a referral, then you have to go back. They'll give you a referral for what? They give you a script for what? For an MRI, right? So that's where they saved all their money. But what happened to Virginia Mason? They got killed on how little MRIs they did. They, they, put, they got destroyed on their budget for MRIs because they did this system in which people started treatment and didn't get the MRIs right away. So there is a danger in jumping too soon because you might not be around to take advantage of the fact that you got there first, right? So timing really matters in this whole thing. So a lot of key questions are being brought up. This will continue no matter what happens with the election. We'll always talk about these things. By the way, a majority of primary care physicians do get paid on productivity. So um, the idea that academic medical centers you know, are immune from dealing with productivity is not the case. It's that way everywhere now. So what's required in the future to do well under this system? So here's the slide I told you to show, the triple aim slide. Right? Every other talk about policy, you'll hear about the triple aim. It's the idea of higher quality care at a lower cost, and also thinking about service to the patient. Service meaning not only their experience, but also access is an element of service, right? I'm going to make the argument that really um, there's a new um, Annals of Family Medicine uh, article that actually talks about the quadruple aim. Have you seen what they feel is the missing aim? Anyone seen this article? It's provider satisfaction. If we don't hit the quadruple aim, if we do these three other things at the expense of wellness for physicians, burnout and those things are going to make it very, very hard to provide higher quality care at a lower cost. So some of the core competencies we're going to need um, is the ability to work as a team. There's going to be a very sophisticated infrastructure. You've got to align goals and systems. Um, you're going to have to work. Think about productivity and efficiency. Um, and a lot of times, what you're, what you're going to see is the primary care physician appointment of the future is going to be an hour long, but five minutes with the doctor. It's going to be hot. It's going to be everything that could be done by a non-physician should be. If you, in the future, if you're ordering a mammogram for the patient, you've already lost. Just close, close your shop. Because it means you waited for like brownie in motion to have the patient show up in your office to order a mammogram. Well, in the era of big data and EMRs, what should happen is everybody who doesn't have a mammogram in your panel of patients, if you're managing a population, 
should be outreach someone from your office who's not a physician, because in New Jersey you don't need a physician's order to have a mammogram, and that's who should be told to get a mammogram. So having care teams doing this pre-work on the patient is something that's going to happen. That's how you manage your population and have higher quality care at a lower cost. So you're going to see panels getting bigger and bigger because it's less time with the doctor and you really start looking at numerator and denominator touches of the healthcare system with wanting to actually have that denominator be bigger of non-physician touches. It doesn't mean we don't need physicians. It just means that we don't want physicians doing work that you don't need a medical degree to do. That's the ultimate form of waste, right? So if you're doing something, going back to sort of process improvement and lean, if you're doing something you don't need a medical degree to do, you shouldn't be doing it if you really want everyone to act top of license. So um, there's a lot of drivers to success. Um, and you're going to have to execute a lot of these things we talked about. Ultimately, cost quality is really has to be aligned, right? By the way, service is quality. Because patients, if they're more price sensitive, are going to choose things based, if they're more price sensitive and they're paying more out of their pocket, they are going to care about quality. And the bottom line is there's imperfect information, right? How does someone judge whether their surgeon's good? The scar, right? So that, there are some problems in healthcare. You know, oh, my doctor, he's the best. Why is your doctor the best? He does every test in the book. Right? She leaves no stone unturned. So it's hard sometimes for consumers to judge quality. So what we have to do is we have to think about their overall experience. So a lot of these sort of things with Studer and the soft stuff, that stuff matters. And why does it matter? Well, it matters not only because there is some data that shows there's compliance. By the way, I heard the story. There's literally one article that says that there's an inverse relationship. And someone gave grand rounds in medicine, right? And talked about, like, railed about that one article. Um, the bottom line is there's plenty of articles that show that you have increased compliance and better outcomes if the patients have a better experience. Also, you're going to get paid off of it, right? So you might as well start doing it now. You're not only going to get paid off it in CG caps and H caps, but it's going to be publicly available once the end gets high enough. So the government is going to actually pr put out on websites your patient experience scores once you're out in practice. So. How are academic medical centers going to provide, how are they going to survive in this climate? Because academic medical centers have a higher cost structure, right? So we do, you know, you don't have to have an ECMO machine at Inspira, right? But you need to have those things here as a tertiary care provider. So we have a higher cost structure. So what are the things we need? Is That's one of the things we need is scale, right? And so as there's more consolidation, as you read the articles about Jefferson doing things with Inspira, Penn doing stuff with Virtua, I mean, we're doing stuff with them too. But if, if, that, if the consolidation starts to happen, where those partners go with those payers across, those providers across the river, we need a larger and larger population in order to sort of feed the beast for that revenue, right? You need to have an efficient cost structure. Um, so you have to think about cost reductions every year. You have to be more efficient. Right? You have to use technology. You have to use mid-level providers. You have to use health coaches. You have to use, have people acting top of license. You have to be quick to make decisions. So I, I tell my team a lot here um, that you got to fail a little. Just fail fast and fail cheap. Right? Let's try stuff. Let's try innovative things. And let's just do it quickly to see if it works. And then we'll scale it up. You'll see a lot of interesting relationships that start to develop in healthcare. And this is sort of the scale of stickiness. So you can have a clinical affiliation with somebody where, yeah, we put our name on it together and we, we talk. But it's not really sticky. It doesn't mean that you're going to get referrals of patients from those people. Um, all the way up to different levels of collaboration, up to merger, right? Because mergers are as about as sticky as you can get. And each one of these types of relationships has, as you get closer to the right, you have more and more reward, but more and more risk. And you'll see this happening more and more. Every day, you see articles about somebody merged with somebody, somebody bought somebody. That's what this is about. Um, this is sort of, yeah, will we ever get to ACOs? I don't know if we'll get the full capitated ACOs. But maybe we won't get all the way up there. But clearly, there's going to be a push to keep costs down and quality up. So that's the plan. Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. But this is the way healthcare is probably going right now. So to recap real quick, 
service quality and cost. Those are the three things, the triple aim, you have to think about. And while you're thinking about those things, your employer has to think about how to make sure you don't burn out and to make sure that you have a good experience because it's, if you don't like what you do and you can't enjoy what you do, you're not going to be able to provide a good experience for the patient, right? So all that being said, I'm ready to take some questions. So for five minutes, get you out early. There you go. Questions? No questions? Yeah. So how would they judge quality in outpatient settings? I mean, you have, you know, an average practitioner and uh -huh. a world expert on cough, for example. Right. Um, and, you know, two patients come to see these two people and, you know, the world expert catches on to it very quickly. The other guy is like, you know, he tries one thing, then the other thing. But like, how would they reimburse better? Well, I'll explain to you. So there's two reasons. One, there already is a set way to measure outpatient quality, and it's already changing. So it's called PQRS, it's 33 different metrics. Those are the metrics in which people say, these are the metrics of care, the hemoglobin A1C, whatever those different metrics are. They're actually changing to something called the macro, so that's changing soon. But the answer would be on, on part of it would be cost, right? The guy who's the world-renowned cough guy that figures out it's just the ACE inhibitor is gonna end up spending less money than the guy that does a million tests and sends you for a bronch. And overall, now you're gonna have a better, I mean, I would say that's better quality, right? And also you're gonna have a lower total cost. The idea that somehow it costs money to have better service and quality isn't really correct, right? They can all sustain together. But would, it, would the, the world expert make more money? He would under this system, right? Because the world expert spent less money and gets to keep more in his pocket. Maybe the world expert's a woman, too. <laughs> um, other questions? Yeah. Are the patients going to be held accountable at all for, you know, if they actually follow up when they were told to follow up, if they actually took the recommendations that you gave as a physician? Um, so what do you mean by hold accountable? For example, I could have a really poor outcome with a patient who I told, you know, change No, I, I get what you're saying, which is they're not compliant, right? But what would the accountable part look like? Like, would I get not dinged or, you know, I, as a physician, it wouldn't matter. I don't think because, so. Because, oh look, well they didn't follow up, so I can't be dinged for that because, you know, they clearly didn't no, I don't think that's going to happen. I think what will happen is, well, you'll have somebody else who hires a health coach that does follow-up phone calls to make sure, and then their people are, have a higher percentage of follow-up. Look, everyone's attracted to the personal responsibility argument. You could, you could think of 500 reasons why this system's unfair. The bottom line, though, is this is going to be the system that we're under, right? So, I mean, there was an article uh, the last couple of days about um, should, in North Carolina, they're now incentivizing Medicaid patients. If they show up to their visit, they get $20. If they do their health maintenance, they get money. And there's an ethical discussion about, is it really okay to pay people to do things they're supposed to do, which is essentially the inverse of should we whack people when they do things they shouldn't, right? I don't think you're gonna see a ton of that. Um, you, you may see, most people are gonna get hit in the pocketbook, right? So, other questions? I have a question about end of life. That's one of our biggest costs in healthcare in the ICU. Sure. What are we doing to, you know, it's okay if we're going to be doing, like, to give a good service. But on the other hand, there's a lot of people that stay in the ICU for 30 days, two months, that we know they probably are not going to do it, but there's a lot of ethical um, problems involved with patients family's expectations. So what are we doing to like educate better the society around these aim of life? Right, so any question that ends, it's both, so you're, any question that's, what are we doing better to educate society, probably ends in a not great answer that you would want, right? So um, the, the deal with, um, with this is, here's the interesting part, right? I showed you the slide that exactly says what you're talking about. All that spending at the end of life, what happens when you start talking about incentivizing physicians to sort of up their game 
to deal with patients with end of life issues? Like death, panels. death panels, right? So that's what came out when they tried to actually pay physicians for this. So I think we ultimately, um, we will end up coming up with strategies to make us better at dealing with end of life issues. Um, but I th and I think that's something you'll see. I don't think you'll see a direct correlation very quickly of that we're going to pay for that, right? Um, but I think that eventually we will. I mean, look at the data, right? You got to hunt where the game is. There's no way you're not going to go after that portion, right? Go ahead. Um, I think it depends on the institution, right? I mean, you are, um, you are not only, are you, I mean, the chief reason you hear is to be educated, right? So, but, like, I'll tell you that from Cooper's perspective, our strategic plan is to buy, brother, and breed physicians, right? We'll buy them, we'll employ them, right? And they'll refer us patients. We'll brother with them, we'll partner and do these crazy affiliations and do things like our hospitalists are down at Inspira. And we'll breed them, we'll make them, that's what we're doing with you. And so there's an ROI for us to make you and put you out in the world. And may, then you know here, you feel confident here, you like what we do here, and you're more likely to refer us patients, right? That's why you know, it's really important that we also think about your workforce's happiness because you basically ultimately control where patients go, right? The most expensive thing in healthcare is the physician's pen. So I would say that there's still a pretty robust need, right, for, um, for residency and, um, and it's an important strategy, particularly in an organization like us, who our mission statement is to serve, to heal, and to educate. All right, other questions, yeah. So I always have this thought about, so for example, a pulmonary fellow at Cooper does one year of clinical research and two years of, uh, one year of service, one year of research and two years of clinical service. A fellow at Penn does one year of clinical service and two years of research. So to be able to cover their clinical services, they need more fellows. So they would, like, you know, same things for attendings and things right. like that. Or more grant money. Yeah. Right. So do, does grant money pay for that? Does the Depends on the institution, right? So there's sort of this idea that the loftier the academic medical center, the more people are just sort of walking around with, like, really white coats and, like, pontificating, right? <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, the drive is still the same. So if you look at, um, uh, for instance, Michigan. So any of you that might want to do emergency medicine at Michigan, um, they do something at Michigan that's pretty interesting. If you want to do research, you can show up there. So Michigan's a pretty big healthcare organization, right? And a very academic, very, you know, um, if you show up there, you can get hired to do research. You'll spend half your time clinical and half your time doing research. I know someone who just got hired there. They're half clinical, half research. They get paid half a salary. That's it. They got a room with a, uh, a phone and a computer near all these other researchers. They have access to do extra shifts in their urgent care or in their community affiliate that's an hour away. But that person ultimately now has a couple years to fill their time with grants or they lose the room with the phone <laughs> near everybody else, right? Other places are a little bit different. Other places will float you for a couple years. Hey, here's what we'll do. You'll be half research, you'll be half clinical, and in two years, you just lose the funding for the research. And you either have to work more clinically or you'll fill that with grant money, right? Still the most common way it happens is that you take a full-time job and on your own time, you start to try to get into research and slowly you try to get buy down protective time. So there really is a lot of places, even the loftiest academic medical centers feel this pressure, right? Jefferson's already announced that they're going to a new comp plan under productivity. So go ahead. Well, last question, because I, I have to keep my commitment to end early, because that's how you get like more points in the lecture. So go ahead. That question was more for the uh, medicine inpatient side. So there's many times where we have patients that um, are admitted for like disco issues or they need to go to rehab. And we get called by some managers saying, you know, they have to stay for three days. That's actually costing more money. So is the insurance company going to make some changes as to what the- Yeah, so that's is? one of those like, there's always the perverse things that happen because of the incentives. So somewhere over here, the staying for three days before you go to rehab saves them so much money that they sort of like, 
say, oh, well, everyone will eat the other thing, right? So a good example is everyone cares about length of stay, right? And so um, a lot of people lose the forest for the trees, and they say, hey, you know what? Some administrators will say, everyone has to be discharged by 9 a.m. Everybody by 9 a.m. will get everybody out. What do you think would happen if the mandate came at Cooper that all of you had to do discharges by 9 a.m.? What would happen to length of stay? It would, the next day. it would go up by a day because you would just wait till the next day, right? <laughs> at 9, it's 9.15, I guess. Joe will go home tomorrow, right? So the three-day stay is one of those things, right? It's sort of... When, for the portion you see, it seems crazy, but I'm sure there's some other aspect of it that Medicare says this is the way, you know, they're sort of relying that you won't have someone as an inpatient who shouldn't be, and then you get caught on the rack, and you have, it's fraud, and you have to pay money, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, it's the perverse incentives that always lead to these weird things, right? All right, that's it. Thank you. I'll, I'll stick around if you have questions, but thank you. <laughs>